After thwarting Nintendo, creating a post-apocalyptic play place for grown-ups, and belittling a fledgling Netflix, Blockbuster seemed unstoppable. But in the end, much like a certain movie you could once rent at Blockbuster, there could be only one. Video rentals hadn't been a thing for that long when David Cook opened the first Blockbuster in Dallas, Texas in 1985. According to TechCrunch, there was nowhere to rent videos until 1977. The first VCR, the Sony Betamax, had only been available to the masses since 1975 and would not start appearing in many households until 1983. Blockbuster entered the scene right when the rental business was on the edge of becoming mainstream. The rental giant's founder started out as a software wizard who quickly realized that renting out the latest movies could become lucrative per history. What truly set Blockbuster apart from other rental stores was that it had a massive selection, some 8,000 tapes, and a fast computerized checkout that was then considered high-tech. Blockbuster added a few locations in 1987, but really took off when Cook sold part of it to Wayne Huizinga, who headed Waste Management. Are you in the Mafia? Am I in the what? No, nothing like that. It's an actual company. Huizinga took over entirely when Cook left. Not only were new blockbusters appearing everywhere, but smaller video stores were being morphed into them. By the dawn of the 90s, over a thousand blockbusters were doing business. Blockbuster flourished under Wayne Huizinga and several other investors. As The Hollywood Reporter explained, some of Huizinga's business methods were inspired by McDonald's founder Ray Kroc. According to the South Florida Sun Sentinel, Blockbuster soon had its own flag like McDonald's. It also had its own characters, including the Blockbuster kids and their appropriately named dog, Paws. Cook had previously done away with anything X-rated so he could get families in the door. Huizinga later made sure that the chains Blockbuster bought would not rent out pornography, especially those who had seen a significant part of their revenue come from such films. Not everyone agreed with these policies at the time, but as video industry analyst Derek Bain told the Sun Sentinel, any company that wants its stock bought by mutual funds and pension funds better not rent X-rated movies. Huizinga was going for company-owned stores as opposed to the franchises his predecessor wanted to open. He and his partners bought out as many video rental stores as they possibly could, especially the most formidable competitors. Other video chains started to catch on in the early 90s, but by that time, Blockbuster was way ahead of them. You work in a video store! I work in a video store. I want to go to a good video store so I can get a good movie. Blockbuster wanted in on video game rentals. The only thing in its way was Nintendo. As covered by the Sun Sentinel in 1989, Nintendo sued Blockbuster when the latter started renting out games along with movies. Suddenly, you could play Legend of Zelda or Super Mario Brothers for a fraction of the price. But Blockbuster soon experienced a glitch. If a renter lost a game manual, Blockbuster would just photocopy it and charge that person a fee. Nintendo didn't see the reproduced gameplay manuals as legit and accused Blockbuster of copyright infringement. Further, because Nintendo refused to allow any other business to rent out their games, Blockbuster could only purchase them through other channels. As Nintendo spokesman Richard Lindner said at the time, we've never expanded our distribution to include any rental store. Anyone carrying it bought it through a retail store or some unauthorized means of distribution. In another 1989 article, the Los Angeles Times reported that Blockbuster did ask managers at its locations to put an end to copying manuals. Though Nintendo accused Blockbuster of doing nothing, the case went to court and Blockbuster was finally ordered to send each manager a warning letter directly from Nintendo. Ultimately, as the Sun Sentinel reported in 1990, thanks to new legislation excluding video game cartridges from a ban on computer software rental, Blockbuster was able to continue renting Nintendo games. Viacom would eventually buy Blockbuster in 1994 for $8.4 billion. As reported by the Los Angeles Times, the motive was to join forces so that Viacom could prevent QVC Network and Paramount Pictures from merging, with Viacom's ultimate goal of grabbing Paramount for itself. Not only was this a merger of unprecedented size, but putting together such immense cable TV and home video giants meant Blockbuster's stock value and revenue would rise astronomically. Think in terms of billions. Blockbuster tempted Viacom even more by offering a $1.5 billion investment on top of the market power it already wielded. It also helped that Viacom owned MTV, Nickelodeon, and Showtime. Blockbuster's renting and selling of products from those companies would boost business on both ends. Per the LA Times, Sumner Redstone, chairman at Viacom, said the battle to acquire Paramount had reached financial proportions that went all the way to Never Never Land. 
As the Washington Post reported at the time of the merger, Blockbuster saw its Viacom deal as insurance against a digital future where video stores were no longer needed. That day would come, however. As the 90s marched on, Blockbuster set its sights on overseas markets to expand its reach. According to the New York Times, market saturation meant Blockbuster was starting to see a decrease in domestic sales. It had already blown away its competition in the US, and video rentals were expected to slow down because of all these locations. Viacom became skeptical and feared the Blockbuster business would crash. What Blockbuster instead saw was a meteoric rise abroad, following its 1992 acquisition of Ritz, which was then the largest video rental chain in the United Kingdom. After the Viacom merger in 1994, there were 6,000 blockbusters around the planet. As noted by the Times, Blockbuster set out to take the American couch potato concept global. By 1995, it was already getting 15% of its revenue from the 1,400 stores outside the US. Blockbuster is a number one rental chain in the UK. Blockbuster block parties were what the Los Angeles Times called in 1995 Disneyland on steroids. These mega-sized arcades had everything from laser tag, virtual reality games, and pinball machines, to mammoth ball pits and a labyrinth of tubes known as the power grid. Except everything was designed for adults, and the locations were open late. Blockbuster obviously had a reason to call block parties places where grown-ups go to kid around. They were designed to look something like post-apocalyptic city streets, with traffic sound effects that joined a cacophony of video game pings and zaps over a thudding pulse of techno music. There was actually a VR maze called Virtua Alley, in which you morphed into a robot fighting Godzilla-esque monsters. You didn't even need coins or tokens, because you could spend what you wanted on a fun card up front, insert it into a slot on each machine or attraction, and go wild. Anyone under 18 had to be accompanied by an adult. All of this came after Blockbuster bought 20% of the indoor kid haven Discovery Zone in 1993, per the New York Times. It was September 2000, and according to Inc., Netflix was offered up to Blockbuster for a mere $50 million. But CEO John Antioco almost laughed in the faces of Netflix's three entrepreneurs who were eager to sell the struggling startup so it could establish a financial foundation. Mark Randolph was one of them. He remembers Antioco's unmistakable reaction after the offer was made. He told Inc., As soon as I saw it, I knew it was happening. John Antioco was struggling not to laugh. There seemed to be no future for Netflix at the time, which had turned down Amazon's acquisition proposal several years before. They regretted it when the stock market crashed in 2000, and Tioko didn't know it then, but his rejection of Netflix in the fall of that year would be the beginning of the end for Blockbuster. According to CNBC, when faced with the threat of what was then a DVD subscription service, Blockbuster answered by creating Blockbuster Online in 2004. Subscribers to the service were up to a million by 2005, and while it was still at the heels of Netflix when it came to online subscriptions, it was growing just as rapidly. Netflix could have fallen into obscurity after Blockbuster's next move, Blockbuster Total Access, a service that let you rent DVDs and have them delivered to you just like with Netflix. The benefit of Total Access was you could also return the rentals to a Blockbuster store and swap them out for other movies instead of waiting for delivery. This was something Netflix couldn't offer. It was instant gratification meant to lure Netflix customers away. Financial analyst Michael Pachter told NPR, They didn't make money on Total Access per se, but they clearly stopped losing customers from their brick-and-mortar business to Netflix. Blockbuster was getting desperate by 2005. That was when its executives created a strategic plan shared with investors to shake things up, according to the SEC Edgar database. They sought to do this by offering in-store and online subscriptions as well as movie trading. They even launched their own blockbuster brand of video games. The report gave a positive prognosis. However, Netflix, which had gone public in 2002, was not going anywhere. As NBC News explained, by the time Blockbuster tried to make a comeback with mail-in and online DVD rentals, Netflix was way ahead. Blockbuster's attempt to set up rental kiosks and malls ultimately failed, and even total access didn't last. Streaming was catching on as fast as internet connections were picking up speed, and Blockbuster was overshadowed by Netflix and other companies that now made it possible to watch whatever you wanted with a click. Netflix co-founder Reed Hastings told Marketplace why he thought Blockbuster ultimately tanked, explaining, Blockbuster had been unable to adapt from DVD rental to streaming. Remember that 2005 No More Late Fees commercial? 
saying goodbye to late fees was a decision that would come back to haunt Blockbuster. As The Guardian predicted in 2004, the chain was setting itself up to see zero profit increase. Netflix's flat rate for delivering DVDs made Blockbuster scramble to compete. However, when it eliminated late fees, Blockbuster was also throwing away a huge source of revenue. As one customer told NPR, this was an opportunity to rent more movies at once without scrambling to watch them to avoid being charged extra. So what's it been? Three years this March? Look, man, I'm sorry. I've been meaning to come in. It's just I've been busy. Now I get it. But now that people were holding on to new releases longer than ever, it meant they weren't always on the shelves. Another customer told NPR, I've gone in several times looking for movies that are out of stock. Blockbuster did try to order more copies of the films everyone wanted, but franchises couldn't necessarily afford what corporate could. Many franchises stopped participating in the no late fee program after a year of plummeting profits. While Netflix is often said to have killed Blockbuster, if you ask US News Money, it was actually Blockbuster that killed Blockbuster. Netflix ended up way ahead. What began as a humble startup grew to have a remarkably successful mail-in DVD rental business, which beat that of the company that nearly laughed in its face. While Netflix kept evolving as it picked up on new technologies that were trending, Blockbuster was scrambling to catch up. When Netflix saw that some cable companies were offering video on demand and movie downloads, it started to develop its own streaming service. In 2010, Blockbuster finally had to file for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. US News Money says one reason for Netflix's triumph was its algorithm that automatically came up with recommendations based on movies you'd already watched. Companies such as Hulu and Amazon would eventually use this same technology to catch a customer's interest. In 2011, Dish Network bought out Blockbuster, but it decided just two years later to shut the business down per variety. The Blockbuster brand itself wasn't exactly dead after the decision, as Dish saw opportunities for Blockbuster's video-on-demand business. Movie rentals, however, were on the decline, as more and more people were relying on streaming services for new releases or new episodes. As summed up by the International Business Times, Blockbuster went from a $5 billion company to nothing in just a decade. Today, there is only one Blockbuster left standing. Located in Bend, Oregon, the store remains exactly the same as Blockbusters were during the company's heyday. In fact, there is a documentary on this very store called The Last Blockbuster. The Bulletin reports that the documentary has drawn even more visitors to this relic from the past. The best part about the Blockbuster in Bend? It has now become a legit Airbnb that can be rented out for a time warp slumber party like no other. This is the only place on Earth where you can still make it a Blockbuster night.